I'd like for you to turn to the second chapter of the Gospel of Mark. One of the tests for overcomers is that overcomers will take the Word of God seriously. Most Christians I've met do not take God seriously. It astonishes me some of the things they believe and say and some of the opposition you meet. Like in the message last week, we cited the example of the man who on national television takes it upon himself to oppose this particular message and ministry because there's no one else but this ministry that we know of is teaching some of the things that he so violently opposes. But people who oppose the faith message are opposing the Word of God because we don't have to justify why we believe what we believe when it's based on the Word of God. Now, James 5 is clear enough for any Christian to read. So a person who opposes the faith message is simply admitting he doesn't recognize the message of the Bible when he hears it. And... It means that he doesn't understand the operation of faith, how faith works, how it operates. That's why it seems so foreign to so many Christians and even charismatic Christians. So we see here in Mark 2 how faith operates, the operation of faith, and that's really the subject tonight, the operation of faith or how it operates. And while we're dealing with tests for overcomers, I feel it's a good time to maybe stress some of the principles and evidences of the operation of faith so that we don't just say, well, God expects us to believe His Word and move on. Maybe some of you are being hindered in receiving God's promises and overcoming because you don't always know how faith operates. And faith Dear friends, it is completely opposite always, without exception to your logic and your intellect. Faith is foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1. He said that we were super foolish, but faith is foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1 tells us it is. Faith is just the opposite to walking by sight. And everybody you know, almost without exception, is walking by sight. The Church of Jesus Christ has come to the place where it must have group insurance and group health plans to make it through for its ministers and missionaries. Faith is just the opposite to what the religious crowd would approve. Now, don't be offended by the term religious crowd because if you will start advocating the message of faith and teaching and preaching and walking it, you'll find out that that's what will oppose you is the religious crowd. And you'll begin to speak of the religious crowd that exists today just like it did in Jesus' day that want nothing to do with Jesus but only with the loaves and fishes. Again, he entered into Capernaum after some days and it was noised that he was in the house and straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it be easier to say to the sick of palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith, to the sick of palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And so here we see the operation of faith in the account of the four men carrying the one sick of palsy and the events that took place. Among the many instances in the Word of God of healing, some are outstanding examples of the operation of faith. 
Genuine faith is really a privilege to watch in operation because it's bold and fearless. We're talking about faith now. Bold and fearless, persistent, unwavering in its determination to receive whatever God has promised, not to take a no for an answer. Now some of the substitutes for faith that are sometimes set forth as Bible faith lack the characteristics of genuine faith. That's why we want to look at some of them tonight. They lack the boldness and persistence that you see here in Mark 2 because you see genuine faith will not be denied. It'll not be denied. Genuine faith will find a way into the presence of Jesus. When one thing hindered these men and another thing hindered them, they just found a way into his presence. Genuine faith will persist till it finds a way into the presence of Jesus with the need. Take the need to him. Genuine faith will not be hindered by any obstacle in its way to Jesus. In fact, genuine faith will remove whatever hinders it, whether it's tearing up a roof or pulling down the strongholds of Satan. Now in Mark 2, we see here the operation of faith. First of all, in verse 3, we see the need. And they come unto him bringing one sick of the palsy. So first of all, we have a need. And you won't have to look very far in our day to find where needs are. You won't have to look beyond the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's filled with needy people. Poor in mind and body and soul and spirit. Needy people. Sick and dying by the thousands because they don't believe the Word of God. Many of them dying on the operating table because they put themselves in the hands of the medical technicians. Many of them dying on the operating table, many of them, hundreds of them, thousands of them, spending all they have, and like the woman with the issue of blood, rather than getting any better, they're getting worse. And it's all because, you see, they do not believe the Word of God. So when we begin to see the need set forth here, we don't have to look beyond the church. But God helped charismatics to once more take His Word seriously, as they did in the early days, begin to believe Him, began to practice and to proclaim what the Word of God says about divine healing, about faith, to once more to believe His promises, as James 5, Mark 16, Psalm 103, Isaiah 53, 4, Matthew 21, 22, Mark 11, 24, Exodus 15, 26, 1 Peter 2, 24, and on and on. <laughs> Clear promises of the Word of God to take him seriously at his word. Many Christians never take God seriously. That's why they never take a physical or material need to God. They'll take them to the bank, the finance company, or to the doctors, or the hospitals, or whatever. And some, when they do take the need to God, because they've not been taught the operation of faith, some, when they do take a need, only take it in an emergency, you know, when the doctors have given them up. And therefore, they're not taking it in faith, and, of course, if you don't take it in faith, you receive nothing. I mean, you receive nothing except by faith. You can only receive by faith. He says the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Not prayer, but the prayer of faith. He says all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. You've got to believe. Well, the need is obvious. Let's move on. We see now the obstacles to be overcome. That's verse 4. They could not come nigh him for the press. That is, the crowd. They could not come nigh him for the crowd. That was their first obstacle. We're living in a time when people can't get to Jesus with their need because other people are in their way. I mean, we're living in a time when the church is siding in with the unbelieving world in the matter of healing and sickness and faith and the promises of God. And they're standing in the way of those who have need because they're standing in the way of truth and actually many times opposing the truth that those of us who are naive enough to believe the Word of God try to teach. And so just as in Jesus' day the people were in their way to get to Him with the need, we see that religion and the denominational system and even charismatic leaders and teachers many times are standing in the way of the people who have the need. Brother some time ago wrote me a letter, a chaplain in a Southern Baptist college. He'd been listening to the tapes on faith and reading the literature that we sent out. And he said in the letter, he began to give his devotions. You know, God gave him light on the faith message. 
And he began to give his devotions in chapel to the students on the subject of faith and divine healing. He said the authorities, the religious leaders, stepped in immediately and stopped that. Standing in the way of the people getting to Jesus. You see, when you stand in the way of his truth, you're standing in the way of people getting to him. They get to him through his word, through the truth. He said they stopped it immediately. But he said it was rather self-defeating because students who wouldn't give him the time of day weren't interested in what he had to say. When the authorities began to oppose him, why they wanted to know what it was all about, he said, I really had a chance to witness. In fact, one of them received the baptism as a result of me not being able to teach them. So he said, I had to quit giving my devotions because it wasn't in line with Southern Baptist doctrine, but he said, praise God, the message of faith and deeper life may not be in line with Baptist doctrine, but it's in line with the Word of God. So there are some chaplains and Baptists yet who will see truth and proclaim it when they can. Well, there are just a lot of Baptists that will never be able to get to Jesus, like there are a lot of Presbyterians and a lot of Charismatics for that matter. They won't get to him for healing or the other truths that are plainly taught in the Word of God because people are standing in their way. It doesn't line up with their doctrine or what they want to believe. It isn't just the institutional church, though. I get mail from people that are saying it's Charismatics that oppose them, too. One school out in California. I don't know whether I should mention the name of the school, but at least it's a school of theology out in California. He said, there are students here who really oppose the faith message. And it's a Charismatic school. Oppose the faith message. And the positive confession, they say that that's a deception, that that rules out the sovereignty of God to confess the promise of God that you're healed until you find out whether or not it's God's will. Oh, they're strong on the sovereignty of God. It's too bad they don't understand what the sovereignty of God is. That's manology. That isn't theology. Because if you follow that line of reasoning, then they should question whether or not it's God's will to save everybody who will believe. John 3.16 no, they're simply taking a position. If they start believing all the Word of God, it's going to cost them some trials and tests and so forth. You'll find that it's a lot easier to walk by sight right now than it is by faith. But the time's coming when only those who can walk by faith, I mean the overcomers, who can walk by faith will be able to stand. I mean the lack of faith. And God has given us this burden. is why we have to stress it. The lack of faith among Christians, including Charismatics, is appalling. Yeah. Amen. I mean, Charismatics, it just staggers my mind sometimes to see some of the things Charismatics say, who ought to be transformed and changed through the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they're actually standing in the way of people getting to Jesus. So it isn't just being Charismatic that guarantees that you overcome, or that you go on to the end, or that you receive anything from God. One woman I was talking to, ministering to, counseling with, said that uh, she had gone to the Pentecostal church and to the Methodist church. This came out in the conversation. She said the only difference she could see between the Pentecostal church today and the Methodists is the Pentecostal spoken tongues. She said there was no difference because they conducted their services right. along the old denominational formal line, just like the Methodists. She said the only difference I could see was the Pentecostal spoken tongues. But she said the Methodists got their prayers answered, <laughs> which is proof. Dear friends, I got prayers answered before I ever heard of the Holy Spirit because God doesn't say you get an answer to prayer if you ask in tongues, but He says if you ask believing. I'm all for praying in the Spirit. You need to, but God's honoring the faith of a Methodist that believes Him. You don't need the baptism to get an answer to prayer. It'll certainly help, but the significance is that she could see no difference in the charismatic and non-charismatic, except one spoke in tongues and didn't believe the Word of God, the promises of God. Well, there are obstacles to be overcome, and the first one was the people. Then you'll have to turn to Luke chapter 5 for this, the search. They made a search to try to find a way to get to Jesus, and that's what faith will do. It won't give up. It'll seek a way to get to the presence of Jesus. Luke chapter 5. This is the same account. But it's as Luke records it, and the Gospels often give various details. One Gospel will give some details and some another. Verses 18 and 19, And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in. They sought means. They didn't give up. 
Faith won't give up. They sought means to bring him to Jesus, to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because the people were in the way, you see, then they went up to the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst of Jesus. We're told here that they sought means to bring him before the Lord. Faith will seek a means. You know, so many people think all you have to do is ask. Asking is required to receive anything, but asking isn't all Jesus said in Matthew 7 for you to do. He said, everyone who asks receives. Did he put a period there? No, he said, and everyone who seeks finds and knocks, I will open. So the kind of asking we must do is the kind of asking that will seek a way to find the answer. Now, when Jesus said that he that seeks shall find isn't what is so popularly taught today that you're supposed to seek and tarry to see if it's God's will. Now, that isn't the kind of seeking he's talking about. He said, in fact, in Matthew 7, if you seek, you will find. Let's don't forget what he said. People tell us, oh, you got to seek, you got to seek, you got to seek and tarry. And they seek and tarry for 30 years and never receive anything. I've prayed for a woman that had been seeking the baptism about 40 years, seeking and tarrying. And she received in about 10 seconds when she was taught how to receive. But that isn't what he's talking about, seeking and tarrying if it's God's will and you'll receive it. But he said, if you seek, you will find. The kind of seeking you see here in the case of these men is they're seeking a means to bring the need to Jesus. Faith will seek the way. There's no question but that he would be healed if they could find the way to Jesus. So when Jesus said, ask and it shall be given, and seek and you shall find, he's addressing himself to those people who think that asking is all that's required. Well, I ask and, you know, if it's God's will, I'll get it. If it isn't, I won't. No, that isn't faith. You ask and then if there is any hindrance or obstacle to your getting that need into the presence of Jesus then you seek a means to bring it before him, whatever the hindrance is. You see, you're seeking the way to remove that. You don't always know what it is, but by seeking, as Jesus said, seek and you shall find, you're seeking God's way. You're seeking the conditions you must meet. You're seeking to find out what it is through your praying and waiting before the Lord and so on, what it is that's hindering the answer to this prayer. And then there will be a way revealed to you, open before your eyes as you seek. But a person who just asks and says, well, it's been three days, must not have been God's will, and gives up. Now, that isn't what he's talking about. He isn't talking about working and tearing and all of that. But show some consideration to find God's will in the matter, to find out what the obstacle is or what the hindrance is or what God wants you to do or what he's trying to show you. Seek the means. To bring that need before him, and he will show you what it is. Just like in Deuteronomy 4.29, where we're told if you want to be saved, you're not just asking, but you're seeking. He said, you will find the Lord if you seek the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thou shalt find him. If thou shalt seek him with all of thy heart and all thy soul. He said, you'll find the Lord if you seek him. Amen. He shall find me who seeks me and searches for me, seeks me and searches me with all their heart. So some do not find healing, some do not find the answer to their need, do not find the answer because they don't seek the answer. They're not interested enough to seek what it is that's hindering it or what the conditions are for receiving. Or if they do seek, they don't seek with a whole heart. They seek half-heartedly. And half-hearted seekers get about what they seek for. Nothing. This emphasizes what we so often stress, though, the idea of these men seeking a way into the presence of Jesus what we so often emphasize is that you have to be willing to pay the cost to receive the blessings and promises of God. Some people don't receive anything because they won't search out the way in the Word of God. They won't seek to find what it is that's causing the problem and think that prayer is simply asking God and doesn't constitute any effort on their part. Not works, but effort. And this is what distinguishes genuine faith from substitutes. Faith always seeks a way. Now, verse 4, we see something else here. We see the opposing circumstances. Faith ignores them and will find a way. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, and they broke it up. When they broke it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. Now, faith is seen in operation here in verse 4. 
Now, when the multitudes hindered them, they overcame that obstacle. They just went up to the roof. But there they found another obstacle. There was no way to get down to the presence of Jesus. Now, often there would. You know, the houses in the Near East and countries like that are flat roofed and little walls around them. And often there's a way to get into the house from the roof. Come down that way. But there was no way. See, they were seeking a way. And they were meeting opposition. The first opposition was the people, which can well typify the opposition of religion, the opposition, whether it's denominational, charismatic, it's still opposition. Sometimes it's the opposition of your family that tells you you must go to the doctor. They insist on it, a wife or a husband <laughs> or parents for children when the individual wants to exercise faith. People get in their way and won't let them. Uh, friends who will tell you that the day of miracles is past, or the devil who tells you the risk is too great. So the first obstacle was the people, but here's another one. Circumstances. Circumstances. After they got to the roof, they couldn't find a way to get in. Now some who will not let people hinder them will let circumstances overwhelm them, and therefore they're defeated. Circumstances do not defeat you. You can't be defeated by circumstances. You defeat yourself. Why? Because negative, adverse circumstances is what you're confessing rather than the Word of God. Like Peter, he was confessing the wind and the waves. He was not confessing the word that Jesus gave him. Yes, you can walk on the water to me. Circumstances cannot defeat you. They can only show you whether or not your faith is overcoming faith or not, genuine faith. That's all circumstances do. People always blame circumstances. It would amaze you if you had a little earplug in to what goes on up here. Not always. Praise God, some don't even come with a need. Just come and say, thank God for the word. And I'm not criticizing people who come with their needs, but if you could just tune in up here sometime, or in there, or over the phone, or with our mail, it would amaze you how people who've sat under this word months and years stand here and confess their negative circumstances. I know that I shouldn't be saying this, they will say, or not even aware that they're confessing the negative circumstances will proceed to do that. Dear friends, we'll be as patient as God will give us the grace with you. If it takes 20 more years before he comes, or 50 or whatever, we're going to keep stressing that the operation of faith requires you not to allow circumstances to defeat you because they don't except you confess them. I mean, a circumstance can do nothing but provide you with an opportunity to exercise genuine faith. That's all it can do. Oh, it's been a year and a half. Well, what's that got to do with faith? Certainly no one wants to hurt for a year and a half or go through a trial for a year and a half or battle the enemy for a year and a half. But that's the natural, that's the flesh. The circumstances are defeating that individual because they're still confessing them. In fact, you will never release faith until you give up looking at the circumstances. A woman came to me and said, I've got faith for everything but my husband and his giving up cigarettes. Now, he was a charismatic Christian. They agreed together when she heard about the faith message and prayer of agreement that he would be delivered from cigarettes. She said, from the first time we've claimed that, I don't know how many times we have, over and over and over. He'll quit for a while and start again. She said, I've lost all faith in his ability to give up cigarettes. She says, I can believe or anything with that. Well, I said, there's an easy solution to that. I'll tell you what's defeating you. Is that every time he quits and starts again, you start confessing that it's failed, that the prayer of agreement isn't working or that you're defeated, or it won't work. I said, that's what's defeating you, your confession. I said, I'll guarantee you on the authority of the Word of God, if you two will agree together, and then hypothetically, if he started again ten times, you don't even confess that. You confess what God says. You see why it's so foolish to the charismatics as well as the world? Because it goes contrary to logic and intellect and what the religious man wants to believe. The religious man and the spiritual man are two different men, by the way. And she took me at my word, that is, God at his word, and my quote of it, 
And many months later, saw her at a meeting, and she said, well, she was all smiles, said, praise God, it worked just like you said. She said, we agreed together, and this time I was going to do it just once more. We agreed together, and he quit for three weeks, like before. He'd quit for a day or two days or a week or three weeks. She said he quit for three weeks, and then like every other time, started again. But she said, I changed on this one. She said, I did it differently. And she said, when he started again, she said, I just began to praise God that he was free. I ignored it, refused to look at it. She said, he smoked two days and quit for good. <laughs> All right. Now, that's not an isolated case. There's a person who had given up on her husband. Some of you, oh, Brother Freeman, you don't know how many times I've prayed and how many times I've settled it once for all. And uh, I'm just to the place where I'm tired settling it once for all. No. These men refuse to be hindered by their circumstances, and that's called persistence. In verse 3 and 4, you see that persistence. They couldn't come nigh for the crowd. And so when they couldn't, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they broke it up, they let down where the sick of palsy lay. Now, while we are not to work for healing or receiving a promise of God. Nevertheless, it often is required of us that we put forth some effort as evidence of our faith. You see, they didn't say, I think we've done enough. It's too crowded in that meeting. I've seen people look in and turn around and go back. Well, now, I'm not criticizing them. I don't know whether or not they want to come in, sit on the floor or not, but there are just too many, so they're discouraged and go away. But these men weren't discouraged. I mean, all five. I can see the man on the pallet there just saying, don't give up, boys. And we're not intending to give up. This is faith. <laughs> you know, if the friends of this sick man couldn't get to the place of healing one way, persistent in their faith, they're going to find another way. That's the whole point. And so this is persistence we see here. Faith isn't going to be denied. Faith will not be denied. It'll persist. And many times God requires of us some effort on our part. This isn't works, but effort as evidence that it's genuine faith. You see, the muddy waters of the Jordan would not help Naaman's leprosy at all. It might hinder the process of healing. But nevertheless, God wanted some evidence of this man's faith. And so he told him to go dip seven times. You know, that upset Naaman. But sometimes God requires a little effort on our part. When he put the clay on the blind man's eyes and told him to go wash, neither the clay or the washing healed him. But God was requiring there some effort on his part to prove the genuineness of his faith and the ten lepers that he healed and so forth. But some, as we've so often said, will not pay that cost, however small or great, of putting forth a little effort. Oh, so many times people will come for healing or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or whatever the need is, and you will detect that their problem is a little too involved or complicated to deal with. You've got maybe a half a dozen or sometimes more standing here. And so you tell them, there's no way I can deal with this in a minute. Why don't you sit down over there and we'll take time. Let me speak to these others and then we'll take time. And friends... We're talking about putting forth a little effort. Now these men, it costs them some effort, labor and all that. Not works, but labor. But this isn't costing them anything to go sit. And time and again, you can see why I praise God for the patience He's given me. Time and again, they will say, but I can't wait. I'm riding with someone. I can't wait. Someone's riding with me. I can't wait. I have to be at a certain place in five more hours or whatever. I can't wait. My husband expects me home by 11. Now, all the doctor would have had to said in his office, you wait, and they'd have gotten on the phone and stopped the world. <laughs> Let the world stop until I get treated. Oh, yeah, like that woman in Michigan. She wanted me to pray for her. She'd been prayed for a jillion times for cancer, dying of cancer. I said, prayer isn't what you need, dear friend. If it was, you'd be healed. What you need is faith. In any way, healing comes by the Word, Psalm 107.20. I said, we'll be here three nights. You come and hear the Word three nights, and God will show you where you're missing it and how you can be healed. Oh, I can't even get back tonight. This was in the afternoon. I can't even get back tonight. I'm going to babysit. I've already promised her to babysit. I said, sister, you don't have any choice. You're dying. 
won't put forth a little effort. If it's for the baptism, why don't you go on and pray? Because if it happens like Pentecost, then why do I have to wait and you instruct me or whatever? Well, often they don't receive if they don't get the instruction. Or sometimes you give the instruction and they don't receive because they didn't hear the instruction or whatever. But anyway, sometimes God's going to require you to put forth a little effort, and that's called persistence here. So follow the example of these men. When people got in their way, instead of looking down, they looked up. Instead of getting discouraged and looking down, they looked up and they saw another way. And so they went up above the crowd. They got away from the people. They got above the people who were in their way. So start looking up and God will show you another way. You'll find it. Look up. There it is. Oh, I see another way. Well, of course, that wasn't all that was hindering them. Well, verse 4. Now this is boldness. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, now do you see that? When they broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. Broken up the roof. This isn't a tent. This is a house. Faith is bold. It will often do things that logic and reason would talk you out of in a hurry. Tearing up the man's roof. That's what it said. Luke said they broke up the tile. <laughs> this isn't a tent flap, you know, or getting in some easy, accessible place, but they're tearing up the house. Faith is often <laughs> required to do things that go contrary to logic and to reason and to what is popular. Naaman, go dip seven times in the muddy Jordan. There's no logic to that. Like people who get healed. I have sometimes people say that they're doing certain things to act their faith that the doctors have already told them they can't do. And they're doing it, like getting off their insulin. But they tell me that. They don't ask me if they can, because if they ask me that, then I'm going to say, no, you're not healed. Like a man in Dallas when I was down at the Christ for Nations speaking two or three years ago. I was just sitting in the hall there waiting to get on to speak, and he came by and he said, praise God for that faith message. I just had hamburger and onions. <laughs> well, I thought, you know, big deal. <laughs> it all depended on where he got the hamburger and onions. It might have taken a lot of faith. Some places it would take a lot of faith, I admit he continued. He said, now that doesn't sound like much, but look, he says, I've had for years terrible condition of ulcers. I couldn't get within 100 miles of an onion. <laughs> Living on milk and things or whatever it is that ulcer people take. And he said, in fact, the doctors have had me on so much bromus ulcer that my skin has turned blue. <laughs> Literally blue. He said, praise God for the faith message. I heard the faith message and said, that's God's word. You know, just like John 3.16, he threw his broma salters away, started eating everything he wanted. He said, I've not had a moment's trouble at all. Now, it doesn't always mean that you won't go through a trial, but I'm talking about faith is bold and fearless in its determination that it's going to believe God. And persistence is a necessary part of the operation of faith. When you see this boldness and persistence, as you do here, you see faith in operation. Faith is persistent and bold to the extent many times that it will just say, I won't take a no. If that is presumption, God won't honor it. But if it's persistence, he will. And there's a difference. You see, presumption is a wrong spirit. It's trying to force God to do something. But persistence is a humble spirit. It's bold faith, but it's a humble spirit. You can have bold faith and a humble spirit. And I know the difference, and Jesus knows the difference. The Syrophoenician woman had persistence. She wouldn't take a no, and God gave her a yes. I remember speaking one time on healing, and I said at the close, now we're going to pray for the people who want healing tonight, not for the baptism. Now I will pray for you to receive the baptism after we pray for those who want healing, but the message is on healing. I said, please don't anybody come right now for the baptism. Come after. I'll take a little time to instruct you and show you the promises from the Word and so forth. But don't anyone come now except for healing. I'm saying all this in the middle of my sentence. A man's walking down the aisle. I'm saying don't come for the baptism, anybody. Come for healing, the baptism later. And he said, 
I can't be denied. He came to receive the Holy Spirit, and he said, I believe I receive just as soon as you lay your hand on my head. And just like that, he received. That's persistence. It's just like I wasn't saying anything. He said, that's what I've come for, and I believe again. Now, there's a difference in saying, I've got it as soon as you pray, and coming, trying to receive, and hoping maybe you've got something the other 20 didn't have when they prayed for you. See, that is bold persistence. Now, presumption is different. It's a wrong spirit. I know the difference. It was in a charismatic seminar, big high pulpit with a railing around it like this. And I was ministering to some people, and someone down below got a hold of my coat, and almost, I mean, I thought I was going over. <laughs> she said, I am that woman that won't be denied. She meant the woman with the issue of blood, you know, touch Jesus' garment. But I'd never read anywhere where the woman with the issue of blood yanked his coat off. <laughs> says she touched. You know, faith is a touch. It's bold, but it's a touch. She just touched the hem of his garment. Oh, boy. And she wanted special ministry and all of that. It's a long story. It was the day I dealt on occultism and deliverance, and I took about 800 people together through occult deliverance. And she wanted special ministry for deliverance. I said, weren't you here? I said, I just took all of you through it. No, I left early because someone had to catch a bus. And I, t well, <laughs> you know, the most important thing that you can get involved in and get settled are spiritual matters. And people will treat these so lightly, but if the doctor, the lawyer, or the bank says anything, they will cancel everything to obey. Left before it was over because somebody needed to catch a bus. Now, I don't know. Maybe you think that's important, but I don't. Not by comparison. For any reason. I said, I'm not going to minister special to anyone because I said that we're taking you all through it at once. I, you know, I explained all that in detail, took the people through it. Some got instant healings and some felt spirits leaving and all that. It was a real blessing up in Pittsburgh several years ago. But she insisted I minister special to her. I said, no, here's a track with the steps in it, and you can take yourself through it just like these people were taken through it here. But that was presumption. She nearly yanked me over the railing. I could tell by the pull it wasn't a pull of faith. <laughs> Amen. But faith is bold and persistent and won't take a no. No, she wasn't that same woman that I had read about in the Bible. But I see boldness here in tearing up the roof. You're talking many times to people that have never heard the message of faith. If they would just get into the Word of God, they'll see faith in operation many times. It just does the unpopular, the unnatural, goes contrary to what is logical and so forth. Now, we're called as overcomers to walk by faith, but there'll be many times you'll just have to be so bold that you'll be taking leaps of faith. And you'll just be leaping beyond the understanding of most other charismatics. But... The time is very short. In fact, I've got a letter here from a, another individual that speaks of a vision that God gave him. He said he was listening to the tape on the manifestation of our sonship, and God really ministered that word to him, how that time is short and God is preparing us and getting ready to manifest us in great ministry. And he said he was so moved by the message he fell on his face on the floor, and God gave him a vision as he prayed. He said in the vision he saw a grasshopper growing across a vast land that was dry, and as he would hop along, he would come to great crevices that he couldn't walk around. He would have to leap over them. And again and again, the grasshopper would come to a giant wide crevice, and he'd have to leap over it. And he said he came to one, there was a bridge there, but God wouldn't let him go across the bridge, made him jump. And he said, God showed me exactly what he wanted me to see, that the time is very short, and we're going to have to start submitting to the trials that God is allowing to mature our faith, and God is not going to allow us to go across the bridge or to take shortcuts, but we're just going to have to walk it out, and when we come to those places that just seem impossible, we're going to have to take a leap of faith. We'll always find, like the grasshopper did, you land on the other side and not in the crevice. 
What I'm saying is, dear friends, we talk a lot about walking by faith in this end time. You're going to have to come to the place where you take these leaps of faith and God will require that of you through the trials and experiences and so forth that you have so that you can learn to do what is necessary. And we see here in this account in Mark 2, and that is act on your own faith. You see here in Mark 2 that the faith of these four men who carried the man sick of palsy could only bring him to Jesus. You see, faith of another can only carry you so far. Now those four men had faith because they overcame all the obstacles and tore up the roof. In fact, we read in verse 5 that when Jesus saw their faith, so he saw all of their faith. But see, the faith of these four men was not for this man, but with this man. That is, they couldn't believe for his healing, for him, but they believed with him. But their faith could only bring him so far, and here's where so many miss it. My teaching you the faith message can only bring you into the presence of Jesus, and that's as far as the message can carry you. From that point on, you're going to have to do like this man sick of palsy. You're going to have to exercise your own faith. Or, to say it another way, the faith of the men, together with the faith of the sick man, could bring them to the presence of Jesus, but that's as far as the others could carry him with their faith. It took their faith to get him there, along with his, because he couldn't walk. But from that point on, once we bring you into the presence of Jesus with this message, from that point on, you've got to believe and act for yourself. Some of us are still having trouble with that. Some people are still finding it difficult in time of trial and testing to act on their own faith, to stand on their own two feet. Now, as I say, as long as God allows it, we'll be patient and keep teaching and instructing. But there's time is coming when only those who can stand alone by faith themselves, whether your husband can or your wife can or your children can or Hobart can or the whole world can or this church can, you're going to have to be able to stand. See, there will be no one else at that point, but you, only those, will be able to overcome and be used of God in this end time. Some just never mature. Every trial, every decision they have to make, they need help, they need counseling. And you see, this faith message isn't designed for counseling people after you preach the message. The message is the answer. That's why we don't spend a lot of time giving invitations. Invitations in the message. You don't find in the New Testament over and over standing on the street corners giving invitations. They preached the word and people believed it or they didn't. Those who did, they acted. Amen. People have needs who believe the word. They get right up here with them. You know, if it's a need where they say the prayer of agreement or when you pray, I believe, I receive or whatever. You don't have to give a long, drawn-out, 20-verse invitation to try to get a person by psychology, psychological methods, to believe what you've preached the previous hour. You see, that isn't faith on your part. What we're saying is, dear friends, that the teaching is designed to bring you into the presence of Jesus, not in the presence of Hobart or any other minister in this body or anyone else. Amen. Oh, yes, we will stand with you and pray with you and counsel with you, that is obvious because we spend a lot of time doing it. But from your side, you're not maturing if you're not seeing that the message is the answer. The message itself is the answer. Oh, dear friends, don't hear a message on faith and then come and ask questions or relate negative circumstances or manifest some attitude that you're not sure or whatever. When the faith message is preached, it's only to be acted upon. It isn't to be debated and worried over and talked to death and counseled about. Oh yes, we're telling you the facts the way it is. Now faith can carry people so far, like a parent. Parents can believe for their children. That is, they can believe on their behalf. I like to say it that way better than having faith for them. A child, an infant I'm talking about, an infant, for their healing and their protection and so forth and so on. You're the priest of the household. In fact, I have seen children healed like a baby's broken nose on the faith of the parents. The child was two, maybe two and a half years old, had just been in an accident. I didn't ask the baby, do you believe? The baby was in enough shock if it could have understood the words two and a half 
I said to the parents, do you believe when I pray the baby's healed? I prayed for the baby. The nose didn't look any different. I said, now, do you believe God has heard and answered the prayer? Yes. Then you go confess it. And it was the next night, two days later at the most, I think you thought it was the next night, came down the aisle. There the parents sat. There was the baby. Nose perfectly healed. But you see, the faith of the parents can't keep carrying that child. That's back in 67. By now, that child has to do a lot of believing for himself. Well, long before now. You watch me minister to children. If you haven't seen it already, a lot of times four years old. And if I can discern that they're capable of understanding the words, I'll ask them at four. Do you believe Jesus will heal you when I pray? You know, parents will bring a child in arms. I'm not an infant, but a child. Four, five, at least five years. You know why I ask that? It happens only rarely, but sometimes a child will say, no. Do you believe Jesus will heal you when I pray? No. Do you want me to pray for you? No. I don't pray. Now, maybe some of you would. I don't. Why? Because if they're old enough to say no, they're old enough to say yes. Why do we have to be taught that obvious fact? If they're old enough to believe in Santa Claus, they're old enough to believe Jesus. <laughs> Have you ever find, found a child too young to believe in Santa Claus? So they start them out at what? 12, 13 months. Oh, they can believe the jingle jangle of the pot bellied old liar. That's what he is. That's putting it mildly to what he ought to be called. That's the devil in a red suit. <laughs> Parents teach their children to lie. They lie to their children and teach them to lie by doing it. They don't tell them, you know, that God will bless them if they're good, but oh, Santa Claus will bless them. But anyway, if they're not too old to believe the word of their parents, and you know, children do believe what their parents say, promise them something, they're not too old to believe the word of God. Sure, ask a five-year-old. I have asked. I've asked three, less than three years old. And they say, no, I don't want you to pray for me. I don't. Because it isn't going to work. Faith, dear friends, we're talking about. The word of God's talking about. If they don't have faith, it isn't going to work. Why, in and through our church, if some of you can't handle it, put it on the shelf until you can. We've had as young as two and a half year old children saved, baptized in the Spirit, speaking in tongues. Two and a half. Several occasions, three and four and five. That's nothing unusual. If they can be saved and be baptized in the Spirit, they're old enough to exercise some faith for healing. They don't have to understand all I said in this message, but that's why they need to be sitting under this word and not off somewhere in another group. I'm all for believing children should grow up in church like they did in the Bible and not off in their own meetings being treated like children. You'd be surprised. We had a little two and a half year old, you sit on the front row, knew most of the songs, of courses. Couldn't speak much English, but could sing those songs and pray in tongues, speak in tongues. One brother, I think his youngest was, maybe his was two and a half, but he said, anyway, the child speaks better in new tongues than English. Doesn't know much English, but praise in the Spirit. Three and five-year-olds. One brother said that three-year-old fell off his trike, came in crying, Daddy, pray for me to be healed. Three. He said, Mother and I were busy, and I said, go agree with your brother. <laughs> three and five years old already know Matthew 18, 19. A little three and five, you know, leaning together, the heads together, just agreeing up a storm. <laughs> First thing you know, had the answer, and off he went back on his track. <laughs> oh, don't deny, don't deny those little ones the ability to exercise faith. Hallelujah. Three and five, the prayer of agreement. And I have adults wondering if it'll work. <laughs> well, as in Mark 2, the faith of his friends could only bring him to Jesus. From that point on, he had to act. When Jesus said, rise up and walk, there's no way the faith of his friends could help him do that. Amen. Even if they pick him up, they couldn't help him walk. They could walk him across the room and they couldn't help him walk. 
Amen. He had to exercise his faith or lie there. Well, remember the grasshopper, dear friends. God expects you to take those leaps of faith so you can act on your own faith. See, we can believe with you in the matter of healing or finances or childbirth or whatever, but we can't believe for you. Don't trust the faith of this church. There's no reservoir of faith here. It's in each of our hearts. We each have to exercise it. There's power in believing together, but we can't believe for you. If you don't have the faith, wait till you get it. That's why I hand people literature, because when they're talking doubt or not believing, it's better to give them something that'll get them in the Word than to just go through a mockery of laying hands on them. They receive nothing. Their doubts increase. And they say, well, he didn't have it either, or it didn't work, or maybe it's not for me. Remember the grasshopper. We're going to have to start taking those big leaps of faith in order to be able to stand in this end time on our own two feet on the Word of God. That's what genuine faith is. Genuine faith is the ability to stand on the Word of God for yourself. Amen. Would you stand with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Shalabakaramakuriyamakasho. Sobra como si el Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For the Lord your God would say unto you, Let the leaps of faith of which my servant spoke this evening is like plateaus that each time in faith you leap across the crevice overcome your trial you will not only be maturing in the faith but as you leap over the crevice it's like reaching a new plateau because I'm counting them one by one and when you cross one it's not as if you haven't crossed any and you must cross two and three and four but I count each step of faith that you take because it's bringing you, each step is bringing you to a higher plateau toward the mountain top. And as I called Peter and John to come up higher with me to the mountain top, as I prayed and where my glory was manifested, I'm calling you as you take these steps of faith, as you stand by faith, as you do not give up, as you do not complain and criticize and worry and doubt, but move on and walk on and leap on in faith, then I shall bring you on to the top of the mountain where I will manifest my glory to you in a special way, in a way that will not be seen by those who will not pay the cost of exercising faith in my holy word. For have I not said that I honor my word? I regard it even above my name. This shows, my people, this shows my concern for you believing the Word of God because it is only my Word in this end time that will enable you to stand. It is only my Word that will enable you to overcome. And it is my Word that will bring you into my presence with the need and with the problem. And I will overcome it and deliver you from it, Amen. saith the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.